get in the setup situation, always, always, always get in front of that bush, never behind it. Get yeah, in front I of that, that tree, yeah. okay? And then always look at your field of view. Yeah. Where could he come in? Where's his potential avenues are coming in? How am I standing? One really big scenario that this is huge for you to know is, all right, I drop back, I'm calling, I'm 100 yards behind you or whatever. You can't see me, and this bull's hung up. He's raking a tree, he's going nuts, he's screaming, but he sits there. Sometimes I'll rake a tree for like five minutes. Yeah. You move in on him. Okay. Because when they're raking a tree, they have their eyes closed. I don't know if y'all can see that or not, we're watching John Wick because on the way to where we were going to start hiking the mountain, there was two shooter bulls and we're pretty sure we got a good idea of where they're bedding down at. So we have to sit here till what, almost six o'clock? Yeah, till the wind's Almost six o'clock till the wind changes, starts going down, down the mountain. So. We got a good plan of action, but for the next hour and 15 minutes, we're gonna be watching old John Wick here. Listen to me. Oh, and the elk are like right there. Do you remember, this is your blood. 800 yards. I thought I was coming up to Colorado to hike the mountains to kill an elk, <laughs> but we're sitting in a truck watching John Wick. Jordan, yeah. lock it in. God, lock it in. So high. So I had him at 30 close. yards. I thought I had him at 30 yards. I think he was 20. Oh, shit. It's it's definitely not as high as we initially thought, but it look how high it's up there. Golly, it's up there. Yeah. There's blood. Yep. Back. Man. Look how far that's back. That's promising. That's, that's a lot we, better. You that's, might have got him. That's that, promising. That's an that's opportunity maybe, to recover. Maybe now. liver, one lung, possibly. As hunters, we always have bad intentions when we release an arrow. After reviewing the footage, we all agree. 
that elk is most likely dead. As a producer, I'm constantly thinking, what's the story here? And it would be easy to assume that it's about my first elk hunt. But for me, the story is about one of my best friends, Kyle Winquist. What y'all just watched was 40 minutes of Kyle working this bull condensed down to two and a half minutes. For 40 minutes, Kyle stomped and beat up trees, all while bugling and cow calling, just to take a deep breath and do it all over again. 40 minutes of the most epic elk hunt I've ever been a part of. For 18 years, I've dreamed of bow hunting elk. And for that, Kyle, I say thank you, my brother, and cheers. Now let's party, because we're at Badlands Film Festival. We made it. Let's go, beers on Badlands. The game of golf. It has consumed as much of my free time as a hobby throughout my life as any other, next to hunting of course. In my early stages of life, you would either find me working at a golf course or playing one. From elementary and high school to college and on to playing tournaments at our local country club, golf was a passion that drove me on a daily basis. As I grew older and started a family, golf took on a different meaning for me. It of course remained a huge part of my life as it was a way for me to spend quality time with my wife Sherry and son Tristan. I've always found it interesting how people meet new friends later in life, especially ones you consider close friends. But honestly, I think it's pretty simple. You don't search for or just find close friends. There are people that are brought together by being like-minded with similar passions. And that's exactly the case with three of my closest friends, Nick Ventura, Tom Petrie, and Jason Matzinger. We met through the hunting and outdoor community, but I quickly realized that in addition to hunting, we shared a passion for the game of golf as well. Now, many years after first meeting one another, Nick and Tom had an opportunity to expand their Ohio hunting ground by leasing a golf course for whitetails. I jumped at the unique opportunity to combine two of my biggest pastimes, and Jason and I made plans to go to Ohio. It would be a week of golf and bow hunting whitetails, doing both on the same property. There's a little frost delay for our round this morning, so we're gonna go out. Nick's giving us a quick little tour of where some of the cameras and stands are or going to be. I played this course with Nick last July, both Nick and Tom, so I know it a little bit. But it'll be fun to see where he's decided to scout around and hang some of this stuff. You have one off 10. Yep, 10 and up here, actually. We'll call that one tan. 10, okay. Yeah. This, is, this is three, Jason. <laughs> Like we talked about, do we, are we worried about the wind this close to the course? I don't know. I mean, there, west wind should be like this. Yeah, we're 50 yards from the green. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Which is not now the half rack. That's a good deer. Really? <laughs> <laughs> <Wait, wait. laughs> that was five in the morning last night. That's a big white eight.
great ball, Tom. You did it any better than that? Uh, we got two dope. We got two dope coming out. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh we're in. Get in, get oh, in the hood. So big piece of the story here to this hunt was we actually do have permission to hunt this golf course here. And that's a perfect example of why the uh, managers here have just decided there's too many deer and need us to come in and just reduce the number of deer on this course. And what a great display. you hit that well. You did catch it nicely. We're just waiting here on the number one tee box for these guys to hit their approach shots before we roll up on them, little golf etiquette in the deer stand. Hang and sit, baby. Hang and sit. See the blood? Yep. You'll see it when I go back. The front shoulder is forward. That's a dead He's perfect wide shot. wide open vitals? Yeah. yeah. Dead that perfect off shot. Was right behind the right, yeah, that off shot. Got him. <laughs> Way to go, guys. Thank you so much for your help. The 
this is what it's all about. Not the deer, but the friendship and experiencing it all together. Virtues. By definition, it's behaviors that show high moral standards, doing what is right and avoiding what is wrong. The virtues of an individual can vary, but I believe it is my virtues that have brought me to the places I've been, the hunts that I've been on, and the people I've been on them with. And this one was no exception. A lot of times we chase these big deer, we chase these big animals, and we have this idea of what we want to accomplish, like this, this like, this standard or this like, you know, this rating. And um, I just think it's so important to be humbled as a hunter. It's just, you know, we, we tend to think that we understand things that we just really don't. and. Um, sometimes we're fortunate and things really click and, and I think that things can be taken for granted. It doesn't always go the way you think it's going to go, you know, and, and usually those are the hunts that we learn the most from. have a good six days, you know. I think we got plenty of time and we got good weather. Like where do you think we're drawing the line on a moose like starting out on this trip? Like 50 inch? Yeah, I don't really care if he's, I mean, I, I'm just hope, I'm just really hoping to find something with age, you know. I mean, I don't care if he's 45 inches and heavy, mm -hmm. that'd be fine, you know. It's gonna be that 45 inch, like three year old satellite pole. Yeah. It's like the one that's like hard to make a call on. Yeah, you yeah. Know? yeah, yeah. Um, but hopefully we'll just, I mean, I, I, I really think that if we put six full days in up in up in this piece, like, I, I mean, I think there's gonna be age class in there. Yeah. You know, I think we're gonna be able to find something with, you know, six, seven, eight year plus type of an animal, you know. might have made an unpopular decision <laughs> late in the trip, but uh, we passed the bull that was, you know, a nice, probably strong two or three year old, you know, and he, he uh, came into, it's like 35 yards broadside, right in the wide open, called him in, and um, could have been at full draw, and when he stepped out, it would have been a, you know, as good of a shot opportunity as you can pretty much ask for. You know, chose to chose not to shoot. I don't regret it um, at all. I I I wanted to keep going. You know, I mean, we just finally got into like the action we were looking for. We had four slow days, and then Friday was popping, and and you know, you only get one tag, and you only get one one bull, and then it's over. You know, in a perfect sense, it wasn't the dream the dream bowl I was envisioning or whatever, and uh, I didn't want to end it right there. He was pretty, yeah. He was beautiful, yeah. Big pass, man, I would've shot him in a second. I know.
So we, we, we find ourselves at the end of what, what, what felt like the end of the hunt. I think we were all starting to accept the idea that we were going to be hiking back to the truck in the dark uh, without having filled our moose tag. And I think, you know, to some degree we were wondering about like how we were going to talk about that, how we were going to explain that. And um, morale was not super high. It was the last, you know, hour and a half, hour of the day, and it was getting pretty apparent that this probably wasn't going to happen. You know, we probably weren't getting a moose. But we weren't going to quit. You know, we were going to hunt till sundown, you know, right to the last minute of legal. And for whatever reason, Will and I were, I think we were together. You know, I wanted to be, I guess I just kind of wanted to be close to him, you know. All of a sudden, we bumped into a moose that jumped up out of his bed and, and bounded a couple steps forward and stopped. And the coyote walks in to the frame, like 10 feet in front of us. It was like, this is my moose, and like walked right over to the moose and started circling over there. For a moment, we were really excited, and then we started to realize, well, why isn't he running away? And our own minds were questioning what was going on, and, and Will whispered, he looked over his shoulder and whispered to me, I think there's something wrong. I think, you know, I think the moose is hurt. And these coyotes are, there's probably a couple of them in there, and they're circling them. And so it became pretty obvious at that point that the right thing to do was to take him. sense at that point, you know, why we pushed to the very last hour of the last day. It was so we could run into him. You know, it wasn't really the bull that I had like dreamed about, but then it was exactly the right bull to take at the same time. It was what we had to do. We had to shoot that moose. You know, that was a moose that was given to us. And, and I think in some weird way, you know, that moose gave meaning to the moose that he passed. There was an incredible like weight lifted off our shoulder that we were these, you know, accomplished moose hunters, you know. Um, but but in such a different way, we got there so differently than we thought. And there were some really special moments shared after after that. I haven't really lived here in home in Pennsylvania since I was in high school. I went to college in Pennsylvania, but I would still make trips back here to home over holidays, random weekends, things like that. And everything was usually centered around hunting or fishing. And my family understood that real quick that whenever I would come home, chances are I was gonna be out hunting or fishing. And a big piece to that was always getting my grandfather out um, to go out and do things. 
And <clears throat> when he was, uh, you know, a couple years ago, when he was getting around a little bit better, you know, a lot of my high school friends and even some of my college friends all got to hunt with him. And everybody that met him left with warm memories. But that's what makes coming back home and hunting Pennsylvania special to me. Nice to see you. Thank you. Good seeing you. Nice. Good to see uh, you. The first year that JJ uh, invited us out to the farm, we went out and hunted second season. We saw a bunch of deer, and that was his first introduction to, you know, getting out with a crossbow and, and actually archery hunting. We left last year. Um, I, I can remember that, you know, six months, eight months, even up to last week, he was still talking about the things that happened in the blind last year when we did this. So this year, you know, we would love to get a deer, but at the end of the day, it's all about those memories that we made last year and making sure that he has new stories for next Christmas. says, where's the beef? Where's the deer? Where's the deer? When my grandson comes back, well, it's something I look forward to. It seems like it's getting to the point where I hunt more with him. There again, I'm, I'm, I'm unexperienced. He's experienced. A lot of stuff he knows that I don't know. I'm old fashioned. I'm, uh, what do you call it? 18th century. I don't necessarily have to shoot anything. It's, it's fun to get out. Besides, uh, it's quiet. You don't hear nothing until the town come, comes time you gotta find a John someplace in the woods. I got a good idea. Why don't you put those fake horns on your head and go out there crawling all for us? Yeah, that'll okay. work. <laughs> you know, it's easy to get wrapped up in the the biggest deer, the most deer. It's it's easy to see that because it's flooded on social media with that. But this hunt, you know, when we first started doing this with Pap out at the farm, it was all just about going out. Like he he could only shoot does, um, and this was the first year that the family offered up uh, the ability for him to go out there and, and potentially take a buck. But it's never been about that. Even when we're out there, it's not. It's not about let's let's wait for the buck. Let's you know let's try to set cameras all over the place and, and find the biggest deer on the farm. It was never about that. It's always about those you know whenever I sit down with him over Christmas Christmas dinner and you know he's sharing a story from when we did this a couple years ago. That's what this is about. Smoked. 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 <laughs> <laughs> you 
told me to. Smoked. <laughs> she go down. Yeah, she oh, done right. Put her mask down. She's down right there. Where? She ran over the hill. <laughs> I wasn't shaking her or nothing, buddy. I was dead. <laughs> you smoked her. <laughs> <laughs> we, did <it. laughs> we did it. Hey, three years. <laughs> I want the meat. I can't eat the horns. Hey, do me a favor. Yeah. Down my wife so I can talk to her. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Hello? Hey, Mom. Bingo. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Did you? Yep. Oh, congratulations, about <laughs> And last year when we came home and did this, I, uh, you know, I saw how much it meant to him. So, you know, I, uh, You know, a couple weeks ago, I was in the process of moving from uh, Oregon to New Orleans, and this was this was tough to make, but there wasn't much that was going to keep me from coming back here for this. This is all about making memories, and I'm very blessed that I've had the time and the ability to do the things that I've done with my grandfather over the years. We've still got many to go, but this is something I hope everybody else does. And it's not about going out there and, and killing animals. It's, it's not, that's a piece to it, but it's not about that. Get your kid out hunting. Take, take a grandson, take a granddaughter. Start doing th these things with them whenever they're young because it's gonna mean something to them down the road. nail one right between the eyes. Please don't do that. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I can't compare this with the past week to a lot of damn hunting trips I've been on. It ain't like sitting out there by yourself on a cold bucket. Uh, yeah, once in a while good company, but I can't knock the company. It, 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 I'll put up with it, I'll put up with it. My grandson put three cans of buck perfume on. We ain't gonna see ever see him. If it comes right down to it, I said, I could take archery, but I said, if it was legal to set with a rifle. As I told the hunting party I was with at this time, all we talked about was my 30 on six. Put that in my hands, I'll knock them down every time. I could really, you know, joke around and have a good time until we start seeing deer. But this is R rated, this is not an R rated program, so I won't do anything further. I shot a couple deer off that white bucket. And besides that, all joking aside, when you're in the woods, what are you going to do? You have to go to the bathroom, right? Flip the bucket up on the other side. There you got the bathroom to go to. Case closed. Am I screwing up? God's timing is perfect. As I look back, you know, the last 20 years, he has provided for me every step of the way. And so I was trusting that even if I did not get an elk, I knew that I was doing what God had asked me to do. That's what this hunt is about. 2001, I started putting in for preference points for elk in Wyoming. 10 years later, I would draw my tag that spring. 
in the winter of 2010, I was introduced to a little boy named Vitaly. Had the opportunity to host him over the Christmas holidays, and our family was going to pursue adoption. He was just absolutely enthralled with the ducks and the pheasants and even the deer that I was bringing home. He wasn't able to hunt with me at that time, so I'd bring home the ducks and the pheasants, and he just absolutely loved that. So we started the adoption process, and late August comes. I've drawn my tag for elk, headed to a unit just outside of Yellowstone. It's gonna be a, a pack-in with horses, and got the call from the adoption agency that we needed to be in Ukraine in September, the same time my elk hunt. It was an easy decision though. Of course, I went to Ukraine. Our family had the chance to change a young man's life. Without a shadow of a doubt, I was going over to Ukraine and we were adopting this young man. He came home six weeks later and he's been a part of the family ever since. So now fast forward to 2022, I've put in for another roughly 10 years or so and drew my tag this year. I just love the, the scenery in the mountains in Wyoming. I've hunted mule deer and antelope and I've had some great hunts there. And so I was really hoping to get a chance uh, to hunt elk there. I put in for the tag again, hoping to draw in the spring of 2022 with one of my best friends, Larry Kirshner, and he knew before I did that we drew, and so he called me, and of course I was super excited. I've wanted to hunt Wyoming elk for a long time. So we're five days out and my sister was carrying her child to full term and actually had her baby the Saturday before we were supposed to leave and baby Mesa was alive for four hours. Another opportunity where God was just, you know, telling me to wait. I was supposed to leave on Wednesday, but I didn't leave until Saturday after the funeral was done. I knew I needed to be there for my sister and her husband. I drove straight through. It took me 13 and a half hours just, you know, grieving for my sister and brother-in-law on the way out there. You know, I, I waited those extra days not knowing if I would miss the opportunity at my bull of a lifetime. But I knew that God has provided for me. As I look back, you know, the last 20 years, He has provided for me every step of the way. And so I was trusting that even if I did not get an elk, I knew that I was doing what God had asked me to do. The herds were already out early today.
dude. I never had a bull elk go less than like five yards. <laughs> So what have I learned the last 20 years in, in waiting to go on this elk hunt? And one, it is the value of life. You know, the life of a child that lives in Ukraine and did not really have a chance in life without a family, you know, intervening. There he is, there he is. Congratulations. Good job. And the value of the family that God gives you, you know, He gives us family for a reason, and it's to be there when times are tough, not just when times are good. So if there's one thing that I would encourage whoever gets to watch this, is if you have the opportunity to change a life, take it. If you have the opportunity to adopt a child, take it. You never know what's going to happen, whose life you're going to change. My hunt was everything that I had hoped it would be. And in God's perfect timing, that's when I was supposed to kill my elk in Wyoming. Yeah, baby. Well, that was worth the waiting 20 years. For sure. Chad Stillman, 41 years old, retired law enforcement officer, homicide detective, SWAT team operator, SWAT team sniper, FBI gang task force member. It was uh, January 17th, 2018, and it, it started like any other day. But well, little did I know, it would be the last time that I ever wore a badge. Uh, my partner and I got in the car and we, we left and we started driving around the city, at which time we got a, a phone call from a uh, a confidential informant who provided us some information on a, a suspect. It was a, a convicted felon. He was alleged to be in possession of uh, controlled substances and a, and a handgun. And it was at that time uh, my partner Pete and I decided to get some other officers in the area and uh, to set up in the location of this suspect to see um, if we could make a case and possibly find this individual. And we ended up uh, initiating a traffic stop on this individual. Upon initiating the traffic stop, the, the suspect fled on foot, and we both gave chase. Now this is January in Wisconsin, and it just snowed about eight inches the night before. It was cold, it was snowy. And I remember chasing this guy down the road, just begging him not to run. The next thing I knew, we were in a backyard, and I was staring down the barrel of a a 9mm handgun. Once I got to cover, I remember looking back and my partner Pete had slipped and fallen down in the snow. This individual was sitting up, putting, pointing the gun right at Pete. The more we told him to drop the gun, um, 
the more he wanted to engage in a gun battle with us and not comply. We need a shield so we can move up on this target. He still has a gun in his hand. He has been shot. We need to uh, safely approach. Are all officers okay? Just something you don't forget. Officers are fine. We have one down. We need rescue. It was probably the longest, I don't know, five to ten seconds of my life. And I'll never forget, I walked out to the driveway away from the rest of the officers that were giving aid, trying to make sense of what just happened. And I wanted to know where Pete was. I look over and Pete's kneeling down right next to the guy encouraging them, come on man, stay with us, stay with us. Encouraging the officers that are performing CPR on the same person that just tried to murder us. And I love Pete for that. He is a one of a kind guy. He is a guy that can, can flip from warrior to guardian like that. The shooting happened at 4.04 and I think I called Melissa at like quarter after, maybe 4.13. I just told her, hey, uh, Pete and I were just in a shooting. Uh, we're okay. I don't know if the guy's gonna make it. Pray for him, pray for his family. Now later, that night, when I finally got to see her, I asked her what she did. When she got the phone call, And she was home with our little girls, who at the time were like 11 and 9. And she said, you told me what happened. And she said, I went in the bedroom and I hit my knees and I prayed. And she's like, I came out. And I was able to just be mom, because I didn't want our girls affected. We still got that gun point. You still not cooperate. 11 and I'm the days, weeks, and months following that incident, uh, the media ran with lies, blatant lies, and um, it always seemed like no one was up there on the other end to defend us, to, to say, no, that's not true. And before you know it, you know, the, the hero is the villain. And before you know it, we're getting death threats. Kids are getting death threats. Um, there's people talking about doing drive-by shootings on our house. We ended up having a squad car parked outside our front door for two months at my house and at my partner's. Just trying to live a normal life and take your dogs for a walk and every second you're reminded you go outside and that squad car is parked there and you're reminded like, hey, this nightmare we're living is, is real. A couple months go by and um, I get in a pretty dark place. Uh, I get diagnosed with PTSD from all the things that happened through the incident, because of the incident, the threats, the paranoia, the anxiety. No, no dad for doing his job the way he was trained to do should have to lay in bed at night and think about if his kids are sleeping close enough to the floor that if there was a drive-by with the bricks on the house stop the rounds from going through your wall. That's like stuff that I, that I eat you up alive. When there's things that you directly do as a course of your employment, if it affects me, that's fine. I'm mad enough to deal with it. But when you see the effects it has on those that you love and those around you, it's, it sucks. I say law enforcement is, is one of the only professions will one minute you're chasing a guy through an alley with a gun and he tries to kill you and you do what you have to do and you know, five hours later you're trying to help your middle schooler with algebra homework. Those two like polarizing, polar opposite worlds and then trying to make sense of it all and keep your mind in order, it was, it was hard. So I was diagnosed by multiple medical professionals with PTSD and it was recommended that 
I not return to police work, which for me was a hard pill to swallow because since I was born, that's all I ever wanted to do. So I know I had a lot of doom and gloom earlier, but life didn't end. It goes on. I think I, I have made it count, and um, any day I can be found out shooting my bow, which just does something to the soul. If you're watching this and you've always been like, man, I think I want to get into bow hunting, but I've never shot a bow, just do it. Find a friend with a bow. Go to a local pro shop. I'm telling you, there is something just inherently therapeutic about pulling back a string and letting an arrow go at 290, 300 feet per second and watching it hit its mark. For me, it's, it's therapy and I absolutely love it. Yeah, Lord, thank you for uh, putting those there before us. Thank you for an ethical kill. It's cold. It's, uh, it's the harvest that you provided, so we just thank you for that, and we just thank you for this time together and this day. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, dude. Good shot, bro. See you soon. Yeah. Got ten ring, though, huh? Yeah, you did. So there's anyone out there that's going through something tough, something that just seems unbearable at times, know that it's not without hope. It's going to get easier. It can get easier. It takes some work, it takes some grit, it takes some determination, but doggone it, you can do it. Waiting a little line, did you? Yeah, we it's kind of a zoo. I want to tell you a story. When I was young, I was obsessed with archery. But not for the reasons I am now. I could legally hunt deer with a bow before a gun. So naturally, I wanted a bow. He taught me a lot about hunting. The most important lessons he taught me, I didn't recognize until later in life. He got back into bow hunting because I did. <laughs> My dream when I was young was to go on a hunt out of state. I have been lucky at this point in my life to kill an elk with a bow. Look at how long that is, Tony. That's as long as my arm. Which was always a dream of mine. And it was also a dream of Dad's. Last year I was able to take him out on an elk hunt, trying to repay him for something he gave me when I was little. An introduction to bow hunting. This is the story of his first archery elk hunt. Decent bull. Oh, there he goes. One, two, three, just a five, five, five. Just full back. You, you do need G-Nox, I'm sorry.
it is really hot. That might be why these animals aren't moving much, but uh, there's some rain and there's some thunder. Maybe that'll get them up moving, but it uh, feels like it's 98 degrees out here. That ball, I'm like, what are you guys doing? Well, I couldn't shoot, he was behind, there was a branch. I'm like, watching that ball come out. I'm like, oh my god, he's like a four or five point. Yeah, I ranged that thing out there at 35 when I was here, or 30, so I was back here. I'm like, so that's 35, and he was on the other side of it. He shot him for like 40, 40. I shot him for 40 yards. I don't know, I don't know. I'm sorry, I couldn't even breathe after. I was like, oh. Night, I'll bet you're right there. Oh my god. We're at your first, first bull of the bow. That's the first bull I've ever shot at. You're too young to understand the point behind this story. And when you hear your grandpa tell it through his eyes, you will just hear the excitement of a lifelong dream of his coming true. But it's not about the animal. It never is. It is my job to teach you the why. The how, I think that's something you figure out as you go. Hunt with him as many times as you can. Believe me, it goes by fast. I sat with your great-grandfather every chance I could. 
something I'll never regret. You will both laugh too hard and talk way too loud, and you'll hear the same story over and over again. And if you're like me, you'll enjoy these hunts more than anything, and they will be ingrained into your memory long after he is gone. like I've said so many other times before, I'm not sure anything else in life delivers the spectrum of emotions that hunting does. I just want to savor every second of this. <sighs> For me personally, on, on my journey as a hunter, this was the pinnacle. I can't believe this happened. It's officially day one of my sheep hunt, and uh, it's snowing. <laughs> Not exactly what we were expecting, but that's all right. This, this unit is actually very timbered, and so we're just pulling off and glassing these open ridges where we can, and luckily this, this tag, I've sort of set everything else aside, and I've got one, almost- One, two, three, four, five, oh, six. Oh, and Mr. Bear has sheep. Really? You got seven sheep. I knew I brought you along for a reason. Okay, thanks. How's Here, this gonna look, work? Thanks, look out, look thanks out, John look out, Bear. Look out. Sorry, I forgot I was dealing with the munchkin. Oh, really? <laughs> look at that. That's awesome. Nice work. We've got sheep already we got spotted. Sheep. First morning we're out, we got sheep. Yes. So we've got 16 here that we've been watching for a couple days, but we're just waiting for that one morning to look up there be like 17, 18. Come on, come on, come on. Let's hear it, let's hear it. I'm not saying it until he's there. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Don't look at her, look at me. Don't look at her, look at me. 17, 17, 17. You don't need permission. I'm gonna throw you in the river. <laughs> <laughs> We just came off a great high glassing point looking at all the big steep ridges and sure enough, run into another group. Again, it's a little disheartening in a group of 16, only one young ram, but no lambs again in this small group. So that's a group of 16 we've seen, then a group of nine and another group of 16 and only one lamb out of that whole group, which is says a lot I would have bet about the predators in this area. Some of the ewes had collars, ear tags. I'm writing everything down so I can talk to the biologist and give her any information I can. You know, they can't be out here every single day. They can't monitor their sheep. And, you know, sheep are a delicate species and a lot goes into it. A lot of our, you know, financial resources go into making sure the herd is as stable as can be. And so any intel that we can give the biologist is helpful. In my life of being a big game hunter, I've, I've been really blessed to hunt a ton of different species. And I've seen, of course, bighorn rams, but it's so much different when you, when you actually get to hunt them. It was just such a treat to you know, watch the ewes and these couple of young rams. Even though that first three or four days, we didn't see any big boys, we knew that they would show up. Another beautiful, chilly day here in Montana. No sheep yet. Back at it, day eight. There's what looks to be a ram all by itself bedded in the middle. Maybe he's got ewes in the timber, but hopefully he'll still be there by the time we get there.
He's right on the edge of the lake. He's got a really bad, broken back leg. Like his hoof almost looked from this far, from 300 yards away, but his hoof looked clubbed almost. He's got a collar on, and so maybe FWP knows more about him. The right thing to do is not, if I'm not 100% positive he's legal, I can't take him, but I feel bad. Poor guy. It was getting so frustrating too, because we knew that sheep were rutting, even in the unit next to mine, and they're rutting big time. I think we may have a ram skull. And we are gonna hike. It's 100% a ram skull. You think? Yes. You're going 100%? I'm going 100%. <laughs> yeah! I mean, here we are up here the hunt of a lifetime and the biggest ram we find on the unit's dead. Unfortunately, it's the last day with Mr. Bear here. You know that movie Groundhog Day? Where you kind of feel like you're in the same day over and over. Actually, I don't feel that way because we keep seeing really cool stuff. Day 13 of the hunt, things started to change. Oh, we've got sheep spotted. We don't know what they are. There's still three canyons over. And they just vanish. That was definitely, for me, the low of the hunt. As if we need more complications. We can see about 75 yards. The night before day 15, we had gotten a pretty good snowstorm. We're driving into my favorite spot, and I glance up and I see a ram on the top of the skyline, and we're like, let's go for it. I'm just so deflated that he's gone. It was like the second low of the hunt, and time's running out, and I'm getting nervous. Later on in the afternoon, Heath and I drove around to the back side of the mountain to glass, and the second Heath got out of the car, he said, I've got a ram. So Heath thought of a great plan to drive back around, hike up, and we were just gonna sit on that saddle where we know that ram in the morning crossed and wait it out. I'm about 40 yards away from my gun and I hear pss, pss. And there's a beautiful big ram staring down at us. I didn't know if I could move. If this were an elk hunt, whitetail muley, I'm not moving until his head's behind a tree. But he just stood there and he was just staring at us. And I finally whispered to Heath, should I run for my gun? Should I go for it? And he said, go for it. Pretty straight up shot. Heath whispers to me 140 yards. When Heath came over to me and gave me that big hug, I don't know if, if any other time in my 30 years of hunting big game, if I've ever been more excited to have a hunt come to fruition. I can't believe this happened. We did it. I just want to savor every second of this. This has been by far one of the toughest, most challenging hunts I've ever done. I'm so glad we had to work so hard for it. It just makes it so much more special. And it's just, this is one of the highlight moments of my life right here. I'm just filled with so much gratitude and exhaustion. <laughs> and I just never thought this would actually happen. This is just absolutely incredible.
<sighs> and like I've said so many other times before, I'm not sure anything else in life delivers the spectrum of emotions that hunting does. I'm just feeling so overwhelmed. It's just amazing. In looking back at the hunt and summing it all up, to find a deadhead of a lifetime, and then to be able to notch my tag on such a beautiful ram. But for me personally, on, on my journey as a hunter, this was the pinnacle. This was more than I had ever hoped for. So glad it was as hard as it was. I'm so glad I got to share it, some of it with John and with Heath. It'll definitely go down in my life as um, one of my favorite all-time moments. March 27, 2018, was a day that would change my elk hunting forever. Now I had never bow hunted this area, but after finding this set of sheds, I decided to dedicate my time trying to hunt and kill this bull. Then the bull vanished and I just couldn't find him. Over the next several months, I looked over a lot of bulls in a lot of different country, hoping he'd show up, but he never did. So on September 10th, when I was given this face-to-face -face opportunity, I didn't pass it up. I didn't give up on the bull though. In the spring of 2019, I was excited to see if I could find his sheds in the same spot again, and nothing. So I returned in the fall and spent 21 days looking for the bull, hoping to turn him up. On September 28th, I snuck into within 60 yards and arrowed this nice six by seven closing out my 2019 season. In 2020, I not only didn't find his sheds, but I also didn't get the tag to hunt the area the bull lived in. So I decided to try something different and was able to fill my tag on the morning of September 19th. In the fall of 2021, I spent nearly 28 days hunting and never did punch my tag. I had pretty much given up on the fact that the bull was even still alive. I figured by this time, he was probably sitting in somebody's barn or laying in the bottom of a coulee somewhere. Either way, I figured he was most likely dead. Which brings us to here. September 8th. We just spotted a really big bear, bedded all by himself. It's kind of starting to sprinkle, actually. So we're going to have to, like, really be on our game here. It's dead quiet. It's loud. This is a big old boy. But exciting. Man, he is like big six by seven with a big flyer. I would love to get in on this bull. I really had no idea at the time that this was the bull I had the sheds off of. I just knew it was a big bull and I couldn't mess this up. Any wrong step in the process, and it's game over. Now I have to get into my head and tell myself things like, he's 40 yards, third pin from the top, 
pick a spot, find your anchor points, and follow through. Just do what you've done in your backyard a thousand times. And then I remember the last thing to go through my head was, Jason, don't f*** this up. Now let's back up to the very beginning, to this moment in 2018, when I decided to hunt this bull. This wasn't the first time I had found his sheds. Exactly one year earlier to the day, I found his sheds not 500 yards from here. At that time, I thought it was blind luck. So it wasn't until this moment that I realized he lived here, which meant he was huntable. I just spotted the match side to that big, antler that first one. Oh man. Oh it is such a rush to spot them laying there and this is just a dandy tucked back in the brush too. I just happened to see it <clears throat> from the right angle. Look at that antler. Yes. Look at that bull. Oh my gosh, so the first antler I found when we got here was the match side to this bull and it was probably uh, half a mile to three quarters of a mile from here. This is the fourth antler I found, both match sets. Yes, man that is a nice antler. That is awesome. And that's when it all started. Well, it's been right at about an hour. I don't think we even had to give him that. Like, I've never been so confident in a shot. But we did. I was sitting. <laughs> Just like this. The bull is right by that tree right there. He came out, turned broadside. I hit him right there at 40 yards. Go to where I hit him first. There's my arrow. Then you think about everything you've been through. And there's this moment as a bow hunter that doesn't feel like anything less than a dream. best I can. Doesn't happen very often when everything just comes together, the wind, the terrain. Since finding his sheds in March of 2018, I never once put eyes on this bull until four hours before stalking him. And he died on the exact same hillside I found both sets of sheds. 
I really believe this elk was here to live out his final days on this earth. He looked old. He moved old. And was in an area that he'd frequented in years past when his energy and testosterone levels would hit their lowest. It could be coincidence. Or it just could be the perfect ending to this old bull's life. From drawings on the fridge to letters to Santa, my father taught me at an early age to write down my dreams. I grew up with a belief that if I wrote it down, it would come true. After each hunt, I found a pen and paper to document how I would reach the same success as him. This is how I began dreaming, the right way. Chasing elk in the west is somewhat of a pinnacle for most bow hunters. I remember my dad telling me stories and showing me videos from countless elk hunts as a kid. I knew instantly that some way, somehow, I wanted to experience that for myself with him right by my side. I used to look up at the stars and get jealous of the sky. And I wonder what it's like to get to hold them every night. There's definitely something surreal about hearing the chilling sound of your first bugling bull on a cold morning. I found out instantly why hunters from around the world have been drawn to these majestic animals. Being able to see it and experience this in person was like something out of a dream that I'd only played out in my childhood writings. He snuck in about 150 yards of the big bull and then they kind of spooked out a little bit so he made another move. Cow, cow called a little bit and uh, the younger six point came right into about 40 yards. You're hoping the big bull is going to follow him in but just didn't work out that way. We just spotted a big bull down off the ridge. 
ranch right here. It's the bull we've been looking for for a couple days. We'll have to go put our first stalk on him. Hopefully it works out this bull. My dream bull. I don't think I've ever been this excited to go on a stalk. Help with the bow. Help with the bow. I did it. <laughs> My first one freaking smoked him. Yeah, I didn't know if I hit him or not, so I shot him again. Matt! Oh my gosh. <laughs> Dude, I knew if he drew, he was dead. Dude, I was. While the hunt may come and go, the stories passed on for generations. These memories transcribed into reality allow for a glimpse of how blessed I am to have this relationship with my father. It's crazy how something so simple as a pen and paper can propel your dreams into reality. I plan on continuing to chase my dreams the right way.